One and all, welcome in week four. Today we are going to focus on really important and quite specific topic, which is multi-level structure of organizations. In part one, I'm going to explain the whole model and why it's important to study multi-level structure within organizations. It's important not only for organization diagnosis, but also to some extent I will see later it's also important for individual diagnosis. Agenda for this week is, first of all, remember to take part in uh, Dan Asfer's study. Finally, we are going to focus on uh, multi-level analysis in the work on organizational context uh, and uh, to what extent it has implication for a project. And we are going to discuss results of a few meta-analyses related to team features, composition and culture as well uh, that are important for group performance but also important for more contextual aspects like for example organizational citizenship uh, behavior. And then I will briefly explain what you can expect during the work groups that are coming this week. Okay. Let's first of all focus on this topic, teams in the workplace. Because if we analyze multi-level structure of organizations, that's really relevant aspect. Typically, when we focus um, when studying humans or human behavior inside organizations, we focus on individuals. And then, in other cases, we focus on teams. And that's the most basic example of multi-level structure, where we have individuals, and those individuals are nested within teams. As you see on this slide, we have four types of team. We have firefighters, we have, uh, we have fake doctors, but still doctors. Uh, we have orchestra, and also we have great um, team of Netherlands. Think for... Uh, 30 seconds or a minute, what are the differences between those four teams? Of course, those are different professions, but maybe you can indicate specific types of relationships that both groups or all, all those groups um, are different in. What's the difference? when it comes to relationships uh, between team players and firefighters? Or what's the difference between football players and uh, participants of a doctor's team? Let's move on. It's really important before we discuss uh, teams to understand what's a team actually. So the finish of a team involves that a team should have at least two uh, individuals. So team, two or more individuals. Team can be considered only if they uh, perform a task that is uh, relevant to the organization, their function within. They have to have common goals, they have to interact with each other, and to some extent they need to depend on each other. It's related to specific group processes, how goals are attained, and team outcomes. Teams, when we take into account organizations, are always embedded in organization, organizational context. What is really important is to take into account that organizations are typically hierarchy-nested um, systems. Systems, it means that to some extent teams are organized in specific way, there is a structure within the team and also a structure that organizes teams. And it involves hierarchy. Which means that, to some extent, we can expect that teams are nested within departments, departments uh, can be nested within branches, and so on. There is a specific hierarchy that influences also chain of command. So, to whom each uh, team member or individual report to. Let's take a look at 
this nested system. As you see, this indicates pretty complex organization. We have uh, a few main campuses, Netherlands, campus in the uh, United States, also in India. And there are, to some extent, some differences uh, between those campuses. All of those campuses, they report to a board of directors. So it's a hierarchy. Also, each campus has a different department, or at least some of those. For instance, uh, marketing is located in the Netherlands and US, but there's no marketing department in India. As you also see, within each department, marketing, sales, research and development, R&D, or service center, production, we have also different teams that probably are busy with different assignments. As you may expect, those teams can communicate with each other, which makes this kind of organization really complex. So when we study organizations, we want to not only understand what guides behavior of individuals, but also to some extent what guides behavior of teams and also outcomes of specific departments, branches, and overall the company. So to understand the outcome of whole company, then we also need to understand what happens within this hierarchically nested system. To do that, we need to take into account this research model. Let's meet Dr. Faust. Dr. Faust will explain how complex can be organizations. This research model, the simple model, takes into account only individual level. So for instance, we wonder to what kind of predictors can help us to understand the level of individual work performance. And let's say we take into account self-efficacy. We also take into account individual's perception of supervisor. It's important. The way how we perceive uh, our supervisor, our manager, to some extent may uh, influence our work performance. Also, our self-efficacy. If we feel competent, good at job, then probably work better than if we do not have um, high self-efficacy. Situation can be slightly more complex if we take into account team level because employees typically focus on teams and teams are supervised by a, by a manager. So we can take into account also additional aspect. We can take into account team self-efficacy, so what group members think about their team and how that influences both individual and team performance. And also, we may take into account how manager uh, perceives a specific team that also may have impact on both individual and team performance. As you can realize, this is a complex situation. So we not only take into account individuals within a team, but we also take into account interaction between group members and something that emerges as a consequence of those interactions, which is team of self-efficacy. And finally, we take into account the third element, which is manager. If we take into account individuals, we assume that there is a no impact of team level. At this point, if there is no impact of team level, no impact of team on individuals, we can assume that this is an independent relationship between uh, self-efficacy, individual perception of supervisor, individual work performance, independent from team. That hardly happens, but we may assume that uh, that can happen. 
So if we want to understand what affects individuals and also how team level is important, we need to take into account team characteristics. On one hand, we may take into account individual characteristics and processes, but also what's more important for teams is a characteristic that is related to a team as a whole. So team features and team processes. When both elements, so this individual aspects and team aspects interact with each other, we can analyze multi-level features. It's called frog pond effect. What does it mean? Let's take into account this frog. It's an individual. You can characterize this individual by size. Let's say it's a large frog. And then let's see how this characteristic of individuals can be assessed depending on team where this individual functions. Let's allocate this individual frog into two different teams. If you would allocate this frog to uh, the this team, first team on the left hand side, you would see that it's probably the biggest, the highest size frog in this team. The other frogs are specifically way smaller. On the other hand, if you would allocate this uh, frog into a second team on the right hand side, you would see that the size of this frog looks slightly different if compared to the other frogs. It's no longer the biggest frog. The frog on the above, it's bigger. This is what usually happens when we take into account individual aspects, individual characteristics, and also team characteristics. So the fact that also the uh, uh, other team players can have specific characteristics that differentiate uh, our frog or our team member uh, from the other team members. So this frog pond effect, it's related to how performance in, the, uh, in relations, so something that happens between team members, affects individual self-efficacy or other individual level characteristics. We can also translate this frog pond effect into more technical terms. We could say that the frog pond effect is the deviation from team on standard measurement. So, for instance, you have overall performance uh, of team members, an average, and then based on this data and knowing individual performance, you can calculate to what extent specific frog or specific team members deviate from the other ones. So let's take into account this kind of statement. A team member can say, I often perform my duties within the time ahead. You could calculate to what extent this person deviates in his or her perception from the other ones. You could calculate an average uh, uh, based on uh, scores of other minus individual score. Then you would get division from the team. That's the easiest way to calculate this uh, deviation. And then if the deviation is uh, high, then you would say that the frog pond effect is stronger. If there are not large differences between individual and overall performance, the effect is rather small. Okay, 
So as you see, those aspects, interactions and analysis of individuals within team uh, can be pretty simple if we know how to use it. If we know the strong punk effect. So let's consider the same model that you've seen before once more. So as you see here, team individual performance can be predicted based on at least two variables. Team self-efficacy and manager's perception of a team, for instance. That's pretty simple. So it means that you have to measure individual uh, level of self-efficacy, also need to aggregate this effect uh, and represent that on a team level. And to some extent, you can also take into account how individual managers perceive specific teams and to what extent this perception predicts individual performance that can be evaluated, uh, not always, but in many cases it's possible, but also uh, you can measure team performance. Let's take a look at another example that you probably know uh, from uh, week one. This is a graph that shows similar model. And in this case, we have a mediation effect. It means that, that individual level factors, team level factors, for instance, can predict team processes. And those team processes or other states that emerge from the interaction between group uh, or individuals can predict outcomes. And that's important to understand team effectiveness. Besides teams, this team level, we can also take into account organizational level factors, like for example, uh, type of organization, size of an organization, and other factors that are on a higher level than the team level. Those inputs, organization level, team level, and individual level factors, can individually predict the outcomes, but also, as you see in this model, this relationship is mediated through merge states and team processes. Let's move on. Based on the seminal paper by uh, Klein and Kozlowski, we know that team can also be characterized using three types of features. Global features, shared features, and configurable features. Let's take a look at what um, those labels actually cover. Global features can be expressed as uh, objective, descriptive, easy to observe, and those characteristics, they characterize team as a whole. Let's uh, take a look at an example. For instance, location, size of a team, purpose, we may have different types of team. So for instance, one team can focus on innovation, whereas another team uh, can focus on uh, structure or other processes that are important for functioning of a company. Or, for example, we can differentiate between teams in terms of communication tool that they use. That's it. That's this uh, organogram that shows differences, simple, objective, descriptive, easy to observe differences uh, of teams. So for instance, we can say that one team belongs to a branch located in Netherlands, another in the United States, a third one in India, for instance. That's simple. Okay, now let's focus on shared features. Those shared features are related to being a part of a team. So that can be experiences, attitudes that uh, group members share, uh, perception, or values. Cognition as well, what they think about each other. And behavior, how do team members behave within 
um, specific teams. So, the shared features can be, for instance, perception about leadership, or that can be team efficacy, something that can be relatively easily measured and has important importance in, uh, in describing team As you can see, in this case, all frogs, they contribute to one team phenomena, uh, which can be, for instance, experience or that can be uh, attitudes. In this context, specific underlying processes are important. To understand shared features, we need to take into account also the context, what those teams, uh, their contexts have in common, so uh, homogeneity of the context, uh, attraction or specific selection to a team, or attrition. But also it's important to take into account how team members socialize with each other, what's the impact of leadership and social interaction between them. So it means that if you would like to describe the shared features, you would probably take that into account. So if attitudes, so for instance, to what extent those attitudes are related to leadership or the process of socialization within teams. Do team members like uh, the fact how they become a team members or they do not like it? That's important to understand shared features. How we can measure that? We can measure that when you take into account individual input. For instance, each team member fills out a questionnaire. Then we check what's the level of consonants. So to what extent they have similar perception or similar attitudes. And then we can aggregate the data. So if those replies, responses are consistent, then we can think about aggregation of the data. And then if we aggregate the data, we can describe specific team in terms of shared team characteristics. How we can calculate level of agreement? There are at least two ways of doing that. First, it's within group. Within the group, we call it as a within, within group interrater agreement, RWG. Before we calculate, before we use this uh, coefficient, we can ask a question, how high is the agreement between members within a team on a particular variable. So for instance, you measure perception, how they perceive a leader, or you measure the individual self-efficacy, and then um, you may want to conclude what's the overall level within a team of uh, related to uh, self-efficacy or other characteristics. You use a specific statistical procedure that you will learn during a work group, and then you can assume that if the value on average is uh, higher than 0.17 in teams, it's sufficient to analyze data in order to compare teams. It means that if you do a study within 20 or 30 teams within an organization, then you check the level of agreement or consonants within each team. If the consonants is uh, 0.70 or higher, then you can treat teams as a level of analysis. Then you can start, you may want to compare those teams. If it's not possible, so if the uh, coefficient is lower than 0.70, you should rather focus on individuals and do not analyze data on a in, uh, team level. You should analyze that on a individual level. 
Another method to analyze consonants is uh, ICC, interclass correlation. This coefficient can help you to answer to a question to what extent does there be agreement between members within a group as compared to members in other groups. To calculate this, you can use, for instance, a simple f-test. And then you can calculate eta square. If eta square is computed, then you can translate that into percentage of a variance by differences between teams. How actually do that? If you have 20 teams, you can treat those teams as a factor and then compare those teams on uh, characteristics that you would like to consider as shared. If in this ANOVA analysis, if the ETO score is 0.15 or higher, then the difference between, um, between teams is substantial and data should rather be not aggregated. It means that you should rather analyze on a team level, but not on an individual level. It means that if there are strong differences between teams, there can be substantial difference between those teams, the shared um, features. And thus, you should not treat this construct, this characteristic, as uh, an individual level construct. If the explained variance is below 0.15, then you can think, okay, uh, the group level does not matter, uh, does not explain too much variance in the construct that I'm investigating, thus I can analyze that on an individual level. That may sound technical, so uh, I would like to give you a few examples. Okay, to understand those uh, coefficients, let's take into account two scenarios. First scenario, on the left-hand side, involves team one, team two, three, and four. As you probably see, there are no differences between those teams. Actually, they are the same. So if you'd like to use those two coefficients, RWG and ICC, you would conclude that the consonants within each team is uh, really high. It's not one because we do not have six in each teams, but we have also 5.5, .5, for instance. But ICC would be probably zero because each team is the same. So if you would measure here, let's say liking to work in teams, then you would conclude that, uh, yeah, if the scale is from one to seven, that in each team, they like working in teams. Also, the consequence of this pattern of results is that you could say that this construct of liking working in teams is rather individual level construct because teams, they do not explain any variance of liking working in teams. It does not matter whether you're in team one, team two, for the level of the construct. Let's consider another scenario. Let's see that what happens if we measure a different construct, self-efficacy, for instance. This time, scale would be different from one to 11, where 11 means high level of self-efficacy. Then, you would consider that this team has more or less average, medium level of self-efficacy. But there are differences between other teams and the team one, and also between team two and team four, and between team two, one, two, three, and so on. Team two has high level of self-efficacy. Team 3, lower, but again, higher than Team 1. 
And finally, we have team four, where we can observe a very low level of self-efficacy. If you would like to express differences between those teams or consonants using RWG, again, you would probably conclude that it's maybe for team one or for uh, team three, maybe slightly higher than for other ones, but it's lower specifically for team four because you have scores like two, three, four, but also 4.5. So probably in this team, consonants is lower than for team two, where you have scores eight, nine, eight and a half or nine and a half. There are not so many differences between team members in team two, but there are more differences in team four than in team two. So RWG would not be the same for all teams, would be higher, for example, for team two, but would be lower for team four. And again, if you would like to use ICC interclass correlation, the same observation could be concluded, that there are differences between teams. In this case, differences in level in self-efficacy. And if you would calculate ATOS square, for instance, uh, then you would say that to some extent percentage of differences in the level of self-efficacy could be explained in terms of teams. It matters in team in which team you are in for understanding the, the allocation and also the level of um, teamwork. Okay. The next problem is data aggregation. If you'd like to aggregate data on team level, first of all, you need to see whether there is sufficient agreement between team members. You would calculate this agreement, and then if the uh, values would be 0.70 or higher, then you can calculate average score. And then your teams would be level of analysis. However, if there will not be sufficient agreement, you can, or you have to, conclude that characteristics uh, has not been shared. In this case, you need to slightly think, okay, I wanted to uh, analyze teams, but uh, it didn't work out. Something went wrong, I don't have enough agreement. So first of all, what you see uh, is uh, you check theory, based on which you assume that specific characteristic can be shared within team members. Also, you need to see whether instruments are valid and properly constructed. So if there are not uh, many mistakes uh, in the instrument that you've used. If it's not possible to uh, aggregate data on a team level, you can think that probably uh, that's individual level uh, characteristic. So not the teams, but other factors, maybe on individual level, can explain uh, the level of this specific characteristic. So let's say you calculate values within a team, uh, values related to uh, how important is environment. Um, so you want to see to what extent this value, so uh, believe that uh, taking care of environment makes sense, it's important, uh, is shared uh, between team members. And then you would like to investigate differences between teams later on within different branches of specific organization. For instance, differences between teams in United States, China, or Netherlands. You may suspect that depending on a country level, depending on country, whether it's United States, Europe, or China, you may expect different values and also different 
uh, levels of agreement between people. Maybe the United States is more diverse uh, in terms of uh, values. Um, for Europe, maybe it's more consonant, consistent, or in China, maybe it's more consistent. But also, you may expect that there are differences uh, between uh, those countries, and thus also differences between teams located in different countries. But if you do not get sufficient agreement within the, all those um, teams located, then you may think that this specific value is rather individual level construct. And thus, you wouldn't aggregate data on a team level, you would just do um, individual uh, level analysis. So for instance, regression, simple regression analysis. On the other hand, you can implement more complex methods, like for instance, multi-level analysis, hierarchical regression modeling, and then you would calculate effects, different effects for individual or team level. Finally, we have configurable features related to team composition that can be uh, function in the background, education, personality, intelligence, demographic data. Okay, let's uh, see what uh, Dr. Faust suggests, what kind of configurable features we can differentiate. Uh, we can, for instance, measure team composition in terms of diversity, work experience. So whether uh, teams members have different work experience. This can be related to a function background. So uh, I have two years uh, of work experience. Another team member can have uh, more or less work experience. Those kind of features are related to team composition and thus can be considered as configurable features. We can operationalize those features as effects related to a team overall. It's uh, also a feature that can indicate the minimum score. What is the weakest link within teams? Or that can be related to maximum score, highest score uh, of a specific team members, the strongest link, you would say. Or a variance, so differences within the team. So for instance, we can uh, measure uh, work experience as a work-related aspect of a configurable feature. So uh, if, for instance, for a specific task, high work experience matters, then the weakest link would be a person with, um, with just a year or maybe months of work experience. That can be considered as the weakest link. On the other hand, uh, those features can be expressed in terms of maximum score. So uh, who has um, the highest um, level of work experience? So how many years worked uh, for a specific company or doing similar job. Or also we can calculate variance, so differences in work experience as well. That can be um, a way of uh, measuring those configurable features that can help us to describe teams. It's important because for task performance, those features, weakest or the strongest link, are important for the work performance. As you probably see in sports, we may have different teams. If there is a need to go uh, to uh, Mount Everest or win a race, uh, those weakest links have or may have strong impact uh, on the whole team in both cases. But also, lots of depend on the strongest links because when things uh, go wrong, they can help to uh, uh, increase the performance of a specific team. So, it's important to remember that for understanding configurable features, we also need to take into account 
specific effects, so tasks that the teams uh, need to perform. We may have into account, uh, so we may face uh, additive tasks, so when compensation is possible. So for instance, uh, uh, one strong group member can help. Then we may also have minimum score. In this case, uh, in this kind of conjunctive tasks, the lower scoring team member has the biggest effect. So if we go uh, climb onto Mount Everest, if there would be a person with no experience, this person can undermine the whole expedition to, um, uh, to, the, to the summit. On the other hand, in some tasks, maximum score has um, strong impact on overall team performance. Those are the disjunctive tasks. So highest team member has the biggest effect. Can you think about this kind of uh, 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 tasks? Probably you had in mind like creative task. So finding one specific solution for a problem. In this case, uh, one strong team member can, if is able to find a, a solution, then a team can win, let's say, a competition. Okay, I hope that you understand relationship between features and performance, and to what extent this can be moderated by a type of a task that each team need to perform. To great extent, individual features in relationship with features of um, other team members can play important role in explaining the level of team performance. So let's summarize the effects. We may have single level effects, so uh, for instance, team size and team performance. And in this case, we only analyze one level. In this case, it's team level. So to what extent team level uh, mm, uh, team size, sorry, uh, impacts team performance. What do you think? Of course, single level can be also related to individual um, level. So it can be, let's say, individual self-efficacy and individual performance. That's also possible. That's a level of analysis as well. That's a single level of analysis. Also, we may have cross-level effects bottom-up and top-down. Bottom-up, it's related, for instance, to this kind of problems, where individual self-efficacy predicts team performance. So to what extent individual level of uh, uh, self-efficacy is important to understand team performance as well, or top-down effects, uh, for instance, leadership, charismatic leadership. To what extent we can observe an impact of a leader on individual uh, self-efficacy. So, we can conclude that if you do research on a team level, you need to think carefully how you uh, operationalize constructs, which means that to what extent specific construct can be seen as an individual level construct, or maybe can be seen as individual level, uh, as a team level construct. And what kind of research model you can apply. So whether you predict effects, cross uh, level effects or bottom up effects, top down effects, that's really important. Of course, within this course, we are not going to investigate um, to investigate this kind of models but it's really important at this point to mention that this kind of analysis it's really complex it needs really careful consideration one of the uh, research models uh, can be focused only on individual level uh, as you see uh, on this slide so uh, we he uh, here we have uh, prediction of individual uh, work performance and to what extent that can be predicted by self-efficacy, individual self-efficacy, or individual's perception of supervisor. 
but also situation can be more complex. As a research model, we can take into account more complex relationships, like relationships between the levels. One of the examples is this uh, cross-level frog pond effect, where uh, performance that happens within a team uh, as a consequence of interactions affects individual self-efficacy. Uh, also, we can analyze cross-level moderation effects, where we want to predict team performance and we take into account individual self-efficacy and to what extent this is moderated by leadership. Because you may expect that maybe for people um, with low level of self-efficacy, having a, a charismatic leader can help in achieving high level of team performance. But this charismatic leadership may not be important for individuals that exhibit high level of self-efficacy. So you may expect interaction effect. As I mentioned a um, few minutes ago, this kind of models are complex and require experience. Thus, as an element of introducing all those comp concepts, you're going to uh, include this kind of approach into your project. So you can measure organization variables, and let's consider a few of those. Keep in mind that we may have different type of features that can be uh, measured in order to uh, uh, diagnose organization. For instance, we can take into account configurable features or shared features. In your project, you can, for instance, measure shared features, like, for instance, work motivation. So, uh, what's the overall motivation um, of specific individuals working in teams? But also, uh, you may measure uh, work experience as an element of uh, configurable features. And then you can use this data within specific groups or subgroups or uh, individuals in order to see whether there is a consonance between those individuals within groups. Those groups can be teams or different departments. So those groups can be created based on a structure. Also, you may measure your uh, organization variables based on, uh, let's say, organization diagnosis. That can be a type of uh, contract, so you may distinguish between full-time versus part-time employees, and then measure constructs that can be uh, important for the construct that you are measuring. What it means? It means that if you, for instance, are uh, interested in your team, to, uh, to measure self-control and then you would like to see to what extent self-control in the workplace is important for individuals and to what extent can be seen as a team level construct then you can take into account either teams or you can aggregate employees your participants into full-time or part-time workers and then you see what's the consonance level uh, within your groups, full-time and part-time, on self-control level. To what extent self-control can be seen as an individual or group level. You would also calculate ICC to see whether there is a difference between full-time and part-time employees. You can also take into account work experience. So, for instance, compare those groups uh, in the, uh, take into account work experience. Another types of groups that you can create can be team departments. Uh, you can take into account um, you can take into account stress reduction program versus no program. 
So create groups that went through a program where there was a stress reduction versus no program, and then see to what extent participation in this program influenced or changed uh, the level of the construct that you would like to measure. And again, if you measure self-control, then you can see whether there's a difference between groups of employees who went through the stress reduction program and had no problem and just compare those groups. Other uh, ways you can take into account, for instance, organizational culture. It's a construct that typically it's considered as an organization level construct or team level construct. You can measure that and you can differentiate between groups. For instance, uh, uh, between groups that uh, believe that uh, high level of performance and strong ethic, work ethic, is very, very important in the workplace. On the other hand, you can have a group of people who consider that uh, work ethic is not so important. And later on, you can treat those subgroups, those groups, uh, as a way of measuring both consonants and, um, and differences. Consonants would be measured uh, as the RWG, whereas differences would be measured uh, using ICC coefficient. So how to analyze this information, how to calculate ICC, how to calculate RWG. This is what you will see during the work group. And also, if there will be enough time, we're going to show you uh, how to perform the multi-level analysis. Thank you for your attention.